Show. This is Woody Reyes on the Root Dog Show on the Two Lights Dudes Radio Network. I'm live right here on Spreaker for about an hour, give or take the time I press play. Anyway, welcome. Thanks for coming on. Thank you for checking me out. I'm on Spreaker again. I'm on Facebook Live right here on the Two Lights Dudes Radio Network. This will also be posted on the Show.com for everybody's uh, viewing pleasure. And if your ear is tantalized, as much as your ears are, you should be in good position <laughs> to want to check the show out in its entirety again shortly after getting off the of the hour I'm on. It'll be posted on the RudolphShow.com. Wait, welcome to the show. And look, in all in one hour, and here's the whole premise. I'm really trying to cram things in. It's only an hour show. And we're going to dive into a young man's battle, and it will give you a better understanding as to who he is, where he's from, and somehow in some way maybe connect to you. Connect to things that you've maybe gone through in your life, talk about how it may be a perfect fit, or it could very well outline something that you've went through in your life. And when we talk about struggles, you probably know where I'm going with this. We all have our own. Whether you're in sports radio, whether you're working by the counter at a Burger King near your family's house, or your house, whatever, everybody is having issues. And somehow we don't recognize this, but we're all on a journey. And sometimes the journey isn't very well seen. We have to fight through smoke. We have to fight through mirrors. We have to fight through day in and day out situations that could otherwise prevent us and take us off the, the trail of where we really need to go to. But my next guest is somebody who has a journey that he's recognized as being a part of basically who he is. And sadly, sometimes we struggle with those processes. Those processes are the easiest thing to contend with. And either ideally where we really need to go to. It's, it's more like a, an unperfect system. But yet for us, in our own individual ways, and individually speaking, we all have our own processes that we run through. Some are a little bit difficult than others. Sometimes you have to go full circle and finally realize, wait a minute, I've been here before. I've, <laughs> I've seen this somewhere before. I've gone down this road somewhere before. It's not quite deja vu. It's more like vuja de. And when I think of when I think of circumstances, and I think sometimes that we end up getting in our own way. And I don't mean getting in our own way as in we're stepping on our own toes. But what I mean that and how I'm saying that is sometimes our own worst creek we get in our own way. Instead of finding where we need to go, we sometimes stand in a position where we're stepping on our own feet, even though we're not really realizing. And those processes are perfect, and sometimes we have to recognize that we have to make changes in order to help those processes sometimes become seamless. That's probably one of the toughest aspects of all is finally getting to that point. But I'll be honest with you, and this is something that I experience again, something I relate to. So I completely relate to my next guest. I really do. And sometimes our own decision-making processes can really get in our own way. Welcome to wide receiver. Look at in the NFL coming into a 2017 NFL draft. Tyler Jones, Central Missouri. He's a wide receiver who knacks not only the ability to get open because He's done it year after year since the age of 10. Then you see him in high school. High football IQ. Good feet, good hands, good shuttle, good cuts. Welcome, Tyler, to the show. Tyler, how are you? Thanks for coming on to the show. Well, thanks for having me. I'm good. I'm good. Oh, man, you know what? You really want to know? It's 104 out here in Southern California. Let me guess, it's probably in the 50s where you're at. Yeah, hot 50s now. Hot 50s? <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good here. Yeah. You know, there ain't no such thing as hot 50s. 
Hot 50 is anywhere unless you're talking about musical charts. Then a hot 50 may very well be it. But anyway, everybody welcome Tyler to the show. Man, the crowd loves you. The crowd loves you. Look, we're gonna we're gonna talk about and this is not just your average everyday run-of-the-mill interview conversation. Because me and you have a lot in common. We've spoken offline, we have conversations about where you've been, what you're trying to get to, the the notes you've heard, the people that you've had to somehow funnel in and out of your life in order to help you see a lot more clear instead of standing in the middle of the road trying to be that that chicken trying to cross without getting hit. Right. So we have <laughs> we have a little bit of a parallel there. So let's let's kind of start with that. When I was younger, I was always the one who really didn't care what other people thought about me. And day in and day out, I was trying to do my best to make sure I didn't get noticed, that nobody knew who I was. Now, of course, I'm a twin, so it's a little bit harder to do, a lot harder to do <laughs> than most. <laughs> but I wanted to stay hidden. He didn't really care. He wanted to do his own thing. He wanted to hang out with his buddies, blah, blah, blah. Not that I didn't have my own clique because I did, but they weren't the well-known, you know, kids on the block, if you will. You, on the other hand, were doing everything humanly possible to be seen in the best positive light anybody can be seen in. That is you. Always looking at walking into a situation with a chip on your shoulder, always wanting to get the attention, but not only the attention, but to earn the respect of people that you consider your peers. And having a high football IQ means that overall you need to have a high IQ. Because you can't have a football IQ without having a relatively high IQ anyway by, by default. But let's start off with this. What was, it in, what was it about you walking into a situation where you felt you needed to fight to get the respect of people that you surround yourself with? Well, I mean, really... Always starting with football. I've always been. I've always been sports. I've always had to work for what I've got. Even at the little league level. Like at the little league level, you know, I, I, I didn't get up. Like, I don't know how to work right now as far as coaching, but like, my, my parents had to be out to me on me. I had to prove myself in sports at, at the young age. We didn't even made it to high school as a young age. So, just going from there, you know, working hard, you know, for, you know, knowing what I want to do, but not, you know, I'm 10, 11 years old, I don't know, I just want to catch more and run, but, you know, just having to respect where it starts. I think, guys, what you have to do to hold your kids Understand that other other players' parents do their role for them to coaching at that age. So really, just just playing one to one to play is how how you are respect from your peers. From my experience, the respect that I wanted to get from my peers, I think, had to do with knowing that I was going to be myself and do me, and not worry about other people, not worry. About the whether or not you were wearing anything in fashion, right? I was even accused of not combing my hair. Yeah, I know, me hair. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> but I, I did. At one time, I did have hair. So I just want to throw that out there for anybody who does not know me. I did have hair. And I have pictures to prove it. <laughs> I wasn't born like this. But the respect that I wanted people to see and and recognize that I'm able to show them is by being able to connect to them. And that's something that you've been able to do despite having those people around you, your peers. Right. With not only collecting yards of the field, your peers are your football buddies. I mean, they're your, your, your quarterback, your tight end, your, uh, your halfback, your running back. Those, those are your peers. Those 
are the guys that, that you fight in the trenches with every single game. And I think that even still, and I use, I'll use another good example. I was in elementary school. I know it's probably a story I'll probably never tell again, but I'm in elementary school. <laughs> First day of elementary school, Tyler, I sit outside of the room and I start crying. They call my mom, my mom shows up, and she asks me, she says, Rudy, why are you crying? I said, I don't like the story the teacher is telling. <laughs> yeah. And that's kind of where it, it, it started. I, want them, I wanted them to know, I wanted her to know in some way, shape, or form that I wasn't happy with something and I was going to let somebody know. Well, that's something that you've done, but you've done it more with action than anything else, and I think that counts a lot and says a lot about who you are. So we're going to go backwards a little bit. You gained the respect with 600 all-purpose yards, 35 catches, 609 receiving yards, two touchdowns while at Central Missouri, which I think was enough to circumvent wanting that respect. Did At, at that point, did you feel validated? Honestly, like, I, even with stats, like, it was still one of those things to where you can never, like, respect isn't, like, you don't keep it. Like, it's not fair. You have to, you have to keep earning it day after day after day. Once you get respect after one big thing, it doesn't, it doesn't just stick with you. Because a game after, you can make a catch, fumble, lose the game right there. You don't respect it. Really something that I try to, I try to, you know, earn as I go and keep. So really, the whole respect thing as far as stats, yes, it's there at the time, but I, I think I, my advice for people listening is to focus on keeping it, which is the hard part. And I think what even gets harder as time goes on, because people have short memories. They're only going to remember what you did for them in that one particular game. Or yeah, exactly. fine, you know, as a junior you brought the great stats or whatever, but what do you have next year? It's a short term memory situation. But I think at at that point, Tyler, you were looking to get acknowledgement from even a higher source. And I say higher source, I don't mean a biblical source necessarily, not that that would be a bad thing, but to get the scouts to really recognize who you are at the NFL level. And it's interesting. And I find it interesting that despite being six foot one and a two hundred and two hundred pound frame with a four point four and the forty, that didn't get you any looks. People didn't pay any attention. Now, granted, I mean I've interviewed guys from Jackson State, Javancy Jones, 2016 NFL draftee. He didn't get drafted. As good as he is, as good as he was, as much of a past rush maniac Javancy Jones was, he did not get drafted. He didn't. Smallest Division 1A school in the country. And he didn't get drafted. So it's not a real big shocker to hear that you didn't get picked only from that standpoint, but that would be it. Right. But your athleticism on the field was clearly plain to witness. I watched a lot of film on it. A lot of film. I've watched your practice film. I've watched your uh, shuttle film. I watched the game time film. I noticed how elusive you are downfield with stutter steps to full corners, to full safeties. Whether you're put in the slot, whether you're put on the outside, you are really able, seriously able, to make it count with the ball in your hands every single time you're targeted. That's amazing. It really is. To me, it is. And I talk football all the time, whether it's covering the WDFL football team in Los Angeles Scorpions, who, by the way, is one game away from going to the championship game in Dallas, Texas, playing right after the Dallas Cowboys and Kansas City Chiefs face off. How cool is that? That's a way to get noticed. And I'll be there if, if the Scorpions end up winning out. I will be there against the California uh, Sharks. I mean, uh, SoCal Coyotes, excuse me, uh, which is taking place this weekend in India. 
So everybody needs to uh, pay attention to that one because I'll be doing the color. Yours truly. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thanks for thanks for tuning in. This is Rudy Rance of the Rude Dog Show on the Two Life Studios Radio Network. Welcome by at least, in my opinion, a standout Tyler Jones out of Central Missouri, a wide receiver who should certainly get more looks like NFL coaches, scouts, general managers. If you haven't watched Tyler Jones, you haven't reached out to Tyler Jones, you haven't sent him a flare, a pigeon, you haven't gave him the other can for which the strings connected to the opposite can, you are missing out on this guy. Missing out big time. And we're going to dive in a little bit more as to why. So be, be prepared for an onslaught of 44 minutes of glory with Tyler here on the show. In 2015, you played in all 11 games during the season. You hauled in nine receptions, 131 yards, career-high three receptions for 19 yards. In the season opener against Missouri Western, and one catch for 33 yards, which included a win at Nebraska Curie. 2014 played in a pair of games during the 2014 season as a backup. And then to talk about high school, you were first team all conference selection, the wide receiver position, honorable mention pick as a defensive back coach, uh, Leon Height at Trinity Catholic. Which is amazing. Out of four years you were there for one year, helped your team to a district championship in 2010. Second team all conference selection in basketball as well. We're gonna we're gonna dive into all that good stuff. There's a lot there to talk about. Tyler, you can't ever just wake up one day and explode onto the scene. You know that probably better than anybody I've probably ever ever interviewed. But he did it in such a way that that makes an, an individual athlete think that they could be elite. Not that they're not, but you have to work your way to get to an elite status. It's something that's that an organized team sport, which can help direct you into that discipline, that help funnel you way into that elite status. And perhaps it was a way for you to start at the young age of 10 in not so good areas, which at least at 10 years old, where I grew up at 10 years old, I thought it was normal. I thought it was every day to hear sirens of uh, around me and gunshots at night and um, waking up to a steak shirt on my lawn, you know, that kind of stuff. I thought at 10 years old, that was normal. I thought that was just, wow, okay. I guess they don't like me. <laughs> but you know what the worst part is? I forgot my marshmallows. So that's, you know, that's that. But then you thought it was a normal place to play, recognizing as an adult in those areas that you played on had unfortunately went from bad to worse at least at this point what happened around the age of 10 and as you're going to realize that those neighborhoods weren't exactly great to play in much less live in hmm. well well now that i think about it when i think back when i started playing football but to this day, like in 2017, there are, around that area, there are a lot of shootings. Like one of my former teammates actually died um, from some kind of gang thing that was going on where I practiced at. Where I team would practice at, there are shootings at now. So at the age of 10 when I was practicing there originally, obviously I was unaware of that. Not that I would, you know, think anything of it anyways, you know, being that young, but practicing at that age in an area as bad as that, you know, it's not necessarily ideal when picking a team to play for at that age. So it's really just one of those situations to where the older I get, I realize the situation I was in. So it was really just kind of like trying to figure out how to how to get somewhere better at an older age, if that makes sense. Trust me, it makes perfect. <laughs> it makes perfect sense. <laughs> Because the area I grew up in, I was harassed on the bus, I was picked on all the time, I was chastised for a variety of reasons, so on and so forth. And people that I knew died as well in, in my neighborhood. I, I, for me, it was put a bucket, not a bucket necessarily, but a plastic trash can 
sit it on on the sidewalk because my house kind of had a, a a divot. You know, the sidewalk was at one level, and my house was at another. So I had to walk down to get there. But right. you know, my my version of fun was filling it up with water and playing in it because because I I didn't have yeah I didn't have anything else. <laughs> I didn't have anything no, else. Good. But and, and I was also raised around the the Catholicism. And you know exactly what I'm talking about. Catechism and all that and you know, course, yeah. the seven Hail Marys and all that good stuff. Uh, but but you really found a way to fight your way through all of that, going to all these various Catholic schools and they weren't necessarily known for football, of course what Catholic school is, unless it's a charter school, and then it's, if it's charter, it's not Catholic, at least not that I'm aware of. I'm a Christian, so I wouldn't know anything about that anymore, of course. But, yeah. but at times, though, you felt what you were doing was working. And it helped you see that a run into the playoffs was something that you didn't know quite sure if that was going to happen at Trinity. But that's certainly exactly what happened. What seemed to work for you in that single year? which finally produced the entry in the playoffs while you attended Trinity High School. Well, I mean, really, we had, we seemed to click a lot. We were really young my sophomore year, minus one back in Marquisville. He was, he was one who really carried the team, and everyone else really just picked him. So he, he actually, um, this was a dog, sophomore, you know, first, you know, Orson, you know, heard this, you know, and that it's one of the best team, but you know, the, the it's not normally it's a leader. And he's like, he really confident to be able to play. So really, I owe it to him and the coaching staff for, you know, understanding, you know, Coach Leon Hyde and Chief Beckham, they um they knew that I didn't really have the confidence at the time and they worked with me. It was one of those situations to where like, you know, being young in a situation, you know, being on TV, et cetera, stuff like that, like a lot of kids at that age aren't used to it. So it's really one of those things to where like, if you have the right people, to, you know, help, help lead you through it, then you'll be fine. And that's exactly what happened that's gonna be. You know, coaches, I don't think get enough conversation about what they contribute, what they really do. And you can always debate at any level of talent and state to yourself, well, the coach should know, and the coach should be the one that has all the answers. Well, they, well, they don't. But either way, you always want to hear about a coach's debate or a set of coaches or a group of coaches talk about a level of talent that can be an attribute to any team, whether they desire them on the team or they see something in them that allows them to work and create the person that will work for their system. And of course, there are also players that are that are desired and some players who just need a little bit of work. And some coaches usually understand that the teams that they have and the players that they choose have everything to do with trying to make their team as great as possible. What do you, what do you feel as though your saving grace was, you can put that literally or not literally, while attending Trinity Catholic School, which helped you not only excel as a person, but seeing yourself excel as a player at the same time. I really love the, was the coaching staff, like I said in the early request, like or even then at Central Missouri if it wasn't for the coaches, because I got a love coach that they knew that I used to coach high school against them and which invited me up there. Well, at that age, you know, I couldn't really drive yet by myself. So in order to make it to school visits, I would have to find a way. Well, with parents working, or the, the woman I lived with the most at the time, my aunt, Mary Williamson, like she couldn't get me up there either. So it was really up to the coaches as far as getting me on visits to other schools, you know, getting my name out there, contacts. So really like, making me wake up early and all the extra stuff, you know, work out and get extra film and stuff in. It's really them that were making me do it at the time because honestly, I wasn't really feeling it back then as far as football goes. I just wanted to play. As far as like wanting to achieve, like I had never even thought about playing in college. I knew I was to try to go to college, but I didn't think it was, it was one of those things that was for sure 
And then he, my coach would always say, oh, you can play in college, you're going to go. We're going to take you here, 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 and here. So I really just, I owe it to him, you know, pushing me to keep working, pushing me to, you know, keep my grades up so I can get accepted into a school. And then on the visit to Central Missouri, you know, I met with Coach Jamin Paul and just fell in love from there, you know. I wasn't on scholarship or anything coming, so it was really just one of those things to where just come, go to school, play. I already knew what I had to do and go from there. But yeah, really, I just owe it to the to Coach Leon Hyde and Keith Beckham for, you know, getting me up here, getting me the kind of exposure I didn't know at the time that I even needed. So did did the coaches make it comfortable for you? Did they did they put it in, in such a way where they had spoken to you and said, you know what, Tyler, this is what we're looking for. This is what we would be looking for from you, having you make the decision to come here. Was it an easy decision at that point after the conversation, after the visit, to make Central Missouri your home? I mean, really, all it, all it took was the visit. On the way up there, you know, they were telling me what to expect, you know, who the guy was that I was going to talk to, what we were going to do. Really, I was already sold up basically what they were telling me about the program. You know, since Missouri's always been a, a winning program in Division Two, so, you know, of course, I want to be a part of a winning program. So, and what my high school coaches were telling me on the way up to the visit already had me sold like I wanted to go here. And then when I got to campus, got to meeting the coaches and, and, and everything else, it's just, I just knew I wanted to go here. Regardless of the situation, regardless if they wanted to give me money or not, I knew I wanted to walk on at this school. So money played no role in your decision-making process because you already figured out before that part of the conversation was something that was a reality to you that you'd already committed yourself in your mind. Not that you were saying it, but in your mind. You were telling yourself, this is where I want to be. I just need an opportunity to show what I can do. And it goes back to being younger, saying, you know what? I want to earn the respect of this team. I want to earn the respect of these coaches. I want to earn the respect of this university. I don't care what I have to do. I'm going to school. Were you already set? And did you have your mind set in advance? And were the wheels in motion starting to turn before you ever said anything to anybody? Uh, pretty much. It was really like I didn't even have to tell anybody. Like, obviously, I got opinions from, you know, my mom. She, she like, played a huge factor in it as well. You know, she thought it was good for me. But other than that, you know, it was really just one of those do what you feel is best type of situations. And, you know, like you said earlier, like, money played no role. Like, money's never played a role <clears throat> as far as, like, trying to play somewhere. You know, I've always just wanted to play football. So that had nothing to do with my decision. Um, it was really just, it was really just, you know, getting a chance to come up here, talking to the coach, and going from there. Well, it's not like you had your mind made up before anybody knew. Your mom or anybody else knew what you were going to do, how you were going to do it, and what you were there to prove. Ladies and gentlemen, Tyler is going to join me on the other side of this commercial break. Tyler Jones out of Central Missouri. Wide receiver is looking at a bid in the NFL. We're going to talk about some upcoming news and what he has going on, again, on the other side of the break. This is Rudy Reyes on the Rudolph Show on the Two Life Studios Radio Network, joined by Tyler Jones out of Central Missouri University, who's a standout whiteout and knows what he wants, just looking at getting to the next level to help him get along further in his football career. This is Rudy Reyes. We'll be right back. How would you like to make the impossible possible? 